as we cover many an insane movie and numerous cult TV phenomena. Are you ready to get jacked up? Are you with us? Then listen on. Last night. Do you have a girlfriend? No, just me and my mom. This is our chance to start over. Maybe some people don't get to start over. What do you think? This is crazy, Mom. We own a motel, Norman Bates. You're different. What's so different about me? I don't know. It's just a feeling I get. Nowhere is like this. People in this town, they deal with things in a different way. Get a warrant to search your house. No, mother, there's something wrong with me. Don't be scared. I'm gonna protect you. You don't think about the future or what it's gonna happen when you grow up? It's all gonna be good, Norman. I imagine you don't remember much. That'll change. The past is like a noose around our necks, wouldn't you say? It's a whole new world. The seal's been broken, the trumpet blown. You have so much to offer. Your father would have been proud. It's so good to see you again, Damien. The devil has many names. Identified by his number. Six, six, six. Does that mean anything to you? He's coming. The beast. Sometimes God gives you a job to do. And when that happens, you have to drop everything and just start walking. Hey, Casey, how's your sister doing? She just got her cast off last week. She's a lot of fun. Father, that was a lovely service. You want to talk sometime? My door is always open. God, is everyone in this family allergic to light? What do you want? Just call mom crying, so that wasn't weird. You're so mean to her. She only climbs up on her cross when she wants some attention. My daughter, Catherine. She's back from college. She's different. Huh? The way she talks, the way she looks at me. It's not depression. I know depression. There are things going on in the house. In my house, there are voices inside the walls. Crazy person. I'm, I'm not saying you're crazy. I'm... There is something inside my house. It's a demon. A demon? And it's trying to take my daughter. <laughs> oh! oh, God! Oh, my God! Father Marcus, what can you tell me about demonic possession? I had a dream. And you're in it. 
Go on. There was a child tied to a bed. Marcus! You didn't come here for advice. You came for help. Who is it? A girl in my parish. Maybe. Now you believe. You're afraid. Yeah, you should be too. You're being manipulated by forces you can't even begin to understand. Anybody up there? Welcome back to the show, ladies and gents. Got got partners in crime back on the show. We got Mike Hartshorn. <laughs> Thank you for having me, sir. Anytime. David Wolf. Hey, Cam. Thanks for having me, too. Good to be always, back. Always talking with just other hardcore movie and TV buffs. So we are diving into three different, you know, Reboots slash sequels slash modern day continuations of three popular horror movies. We got Damien, which is a continuation of the first Omen film. We got The Exorcist, which is a sequel to the first movie. And then we got Bates Motel, which is like a modern day reboot slash modernized prequel. Thank you all for making this episode. And so we're just going to start off with Norman Bates himself and how we're all kind of just Hitchcock fans. <laughs> uh, isn't it kind of wild how psychological dramas can pretty much take any kind of genre that they want? <laughs> Quite elastic. Pretty much. Because, I mean, you can say it because here we got you know, a show that's both a horror drama and a crime mystery. So, <laughs> yeah. two different camps. Right? Yeah. Like, it's really an amazing show. And, you know, like I was texting you, like, it's one of the very few shows that's based on a film that wasn't just, for lack of a better word, just dog shit. You yeah. Know, like, have you seen the Psycho remake with Vince Vaughn? Mm, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. It's literally just shot for shot, yet it is just an atrocious film. It will uh, essentially, yeah. And I, I comes from a giant Gus Van Zant fan. I mean, I haven't always liked everything he's done, but I've liked his experimental nature. And I wasn't even surprised when I saw Steven Soderbergh had put up a random music video montage, but using Nine Inch Nails music featuring clips from both versions. And I was like, okay, well, that's weird, but okay. Uh, a shot sense. for shot remake is a pretty stupid experiment. Well, and I, I just don't get the point. You might as well. Just, what would be the point? I mean, uh, there really wasn't. And it's just like, why not just, you might as well just make a YouTube music video. Because, I mean, it's just like, or. Or a student film. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, student Absolutely. film reenactment for class to see if you can do your own take on a pre-existing scene, see how creative you can be. But it's just like, man, I mean. <laughs> but. The show itself, I think, actually does a really good job at sticking to the original formula while switching it up and, you know, kind of making it its own, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I totally get it, because, I mean, I mean, you had Carlson Case, who's worked on every kind of show, whether it's right. Briscoe County and Lost and then just all these other just experimental and just outright hilarious shows. He even makes a cameo as one of the deputies who pulls over uh, uh, Janet Lee's character, who's played in this version by Rihanna. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually did. I think she did a great job, to my surprise. Oh well, and it was a very. This is kind of an example of a stunt casting that just kind of works. And since it's right. filmed in British Columbia, I was not surprised. You know, Vancouver, I was not surprised to see just every other Canadian kind of actor appear on here either. You know, and <laughs> but yeah, she was apparently a huge fan of the show, so that's why she guest starred. And it was interesting because. You think, oh dear, they're gonna just again, like you say, just do a copy of a copy. 
just right and repeat you know the experience is like nope <laughs> everything's gonna go in an entirely different direction each and every time and you just never know what you're in for and i mean she did an interesting portrayal of marion crane because you know when we see the original psycho movie we don't know you know entirely where she's from and it's like they they hint at is like yeah she's uh basically got a terrible secretary job and just being treated poorly by all these businessmen who are pigs. And it's like, yeah, that makes you wonder if Hitchcock wanted to go for that, but didn't, you know, just <laughs> instead focus it on the chills and frills. So. Right. <clears throat> what do you guys think of the music and how they try to kind of go in their own direction instead of directly replicate the score of Psycho? I think for the most part it worked. Some of it kind of missed the mark for me a little bit, but I think for the most part, they did a good job with it. Some of it does kind of just fade into the background after a while where you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I think that goes with damn near any movie or TV show out there for the most part. Essentially, because, I mean, you just got to find a score that makes, you know, you know, gets in the I... can and cuts the mark. Sorry, go ahead. And I watched it during its initial run, and I actually cannot really think of the score. So that probably speaks to uh, it in relation to the Psycho score, which is... All right. <laughs> it's just interesting, because, I mean, music, I think, is really a key at getting me in the mood for a freaky movie. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And it can break it if I just got just a very cheesy violin or overdone piano. I just instantly go, okay, so this is a Sunday night, 2 a.m. movie. Got it. <laughs> I, the high of that for me is Suspiria, the original. I don't know. No, like yeah, either of those. The, huh? the, the music in Suspiria, I, you know, can't fathom the film without that. Well, that's a good example. I mean, there's a lot of Italian terror films that pretty much – uh, just you, you could tell which ones were being invented versus doing illegal samples of, you know, famous movie scores. And yeah, <laughs> Argento held no punches on that one. And uh, I, I, it's interesting because I, I see a little of Argento, let alone just some kind of giallo influence in every kind of movie, regardless of any, if anyone says it on the record is like, yeah, someone definitely saw this in a drive-in at the, you know, back in the day. Cause they're not played all that often on movie channels. So, you know, <laughs> No, definitely not. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, so, uh, why is just watching an uh, incestuous family just very intriguing to... <laughs> that <laughs> is... I mean, that's what did it for me with this show. Like, I feel like the series was almost two different series, at least for me, because especially early on in the first, second, maybe third season, the plotting, it, it, it was just too heavy and too much going on and too many ridiculous things that I, I probably almost given up on the series a few times, but I did not. And I stuck with it because of that relationship between Norma and Norman. It's yeah. Perverse ever three on and, television. I think uh, probably uh, season but, three and four kind of have a lot of episodes where you're like, okay, three episodes could have just been one episode, but I get it. You got to stretch it out to make the cut every week but whatever I, i'm still in it for the long run i like the i just brilliant casting of again you know just freddie highmore who's you know was a lovable kid actor and here he is in his first and big series channel, channel uh, more of a, i mean that that was anthony perkins as you know at that age i could visualize it like and unlike perkins he'll have a lot of freedom from this point forth while Perkins oh, like, got a pigeonhole you know? <laughs> no. to where he finally just said, screw it. I'll start directing these psycho movies since that's all anyone wants me to play. <laughs> but, but, but the characterization is what really did it for me with this series. Like, like that's what kept me with it. And I, and I think it got better actually later on, as far as the plot goes. So maybe uh, in season, what, oh, I guess we're, you know, spoil, spoiling the show. So spoiling. Yeah, sorry guys, don't yeah. fucking listen. Uh, start <laughs> in the direction of the original movie um, later on. Right. It, Actually, it, it give really you an idea. Thing what they do, they uh, update it, they modernize it, and, and they. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I, I was impressed that they didn't spend too much time even on necessarily even just the other colorful individuals. It's like pretty much we're only going to focus on the ones that are actually important or yeah, affect the plot. I mean, in some was, way. 
it gave me the creeps. I, that that it was... just looking at that place, you're like, yeah, burn this place <laughs> to the ground. And uh, I don't, I can't even figure out how I actually, why I gave the series a chance because I, normally I wouldn't. It was on A and E, which is not. For me, like uh, right, I, I, a prestige network where like I'm gonna, you know, something's on AMC. They were with, great in their uh, heyday when they were just saying, "Hey, let's just play the best of the best, just acclaimed TV shows from both network and just overseas." And then it's like along the way, they just decided, well, whatever History Channel, you know, sister channel, doesn't buy, we're airing, and oh, let's air a few other creative cable TV shows. Oh, and just let's cancel them because at the end of the day, we just want to play reality shows. But this this series it it drew me in. Like I said, I thought the plot got kind of absurd at times, to the to the point where I did consider giving up. But I, I stuck with it from beginning to end, and I, I think it was worth it. I think it was a really good series overall. Yeah, I, sorry, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> oh, you're good, man. I was just say I remember you know I started it when it came out. Just because, you know, I was a huge fan of Psycho, and I thought Freddie Highmore was, you know, a pretty up-and-coming actor. And I've, mm-hmm. lo- I've always loved Vera Farmiga ever since I was introduced to her in The Departed. And I'm like right. David said, I stopped watching around, I want to say, after season three. And then, yeah, I didn't watch season four, and then I started hearing that the final season was coming out. And I was like, okay, I really want to see how they do this. So I went back and just got completely caught up. And I'm really glad I did, because I think they ended it, I'd say, near perfectly. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah, they they knew that was just the final year, and they didn't want to keep exhausting it, saying, "Oh, are we getting picked up or not?" And it's like, and I, I will get give you this. I mean, when they have that other guy who's just growing drugs and everything, chick, you know, played by Ryan oh. Hurst, you might know from Sons of Anarchy, and We Were Soldiers, among other things. He's it was just interesting. He's now currently on Bosch as like the intimidating private eye who works for the attorney's office to spy on people <laughs> and it's, it's kind of wild how i think this was just the first intimidating role i have seen i think we've all seen him in <laughs> how shocked were you guys when norma died i mean i felt like it was coming but i, didn't... I was already done with her at that point so i was just like yeah that makes sense because Eventually, it is going to happen. I mean, that's the basis of Psycho. He thinks his mom is still alive, and he's in denial. But... End on that. I did not see it coming in season four. Okay, well, there you go. I, yeah, I didn't. I didn't foresee a season with, uh, without her alive. I mean, obviously, she she was still in it, but um, you know, she was dead. What do you think of the portrayal of Olivia Cook's uh, Emma? You know, it's it's rare that you see a portrayal of a lung disorder. You know, on any kind of TV. I, I was actually going to bring her up too because I do. You think that was necessary to give her that disorder? Do you, I think it kind of her character, but, and yeah. you know, like sympathy, character development, all that stuff. I I think it really worked personally, but I get where you're coming from as well. But I think Olivia Cook absolutely killed it. I, I mean, I think they just needed to show people who were even more unfortunate than Norman and just make you wonder, you know, will he take advantage of them or will he use them to his advantage or will he just pretty much see a little of himself in them? It's just an interesting predicament, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you. This could have easily backfired in less capable hands. It could have easily been, oh, okay, now this is a bad exploitation show, you know? The, 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 uh, <clears throat> the oxygen tank felt a little like a prop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could have used a little more better direction in that regard, but yeah, I, I mean... I, I know they're not going to do a hundred percent of it, you know, service. So it is, you know, it, it kind of just comes down to just, again, the directing and the staging of it. I mean, I just seeing this now, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of Olivia cook from thoroughbreds and ready player she one. Was, I, I think everyone really was at least confident, but like she, she was great. And obviously and another yeah. English actress, just like i more <laughs> like, I, man. Yeah, you start you start hearing them talk, and it's like, whoa! <laughs> I did not expect that accent. It's wild. <laughs> Definitely. What did y'all uh, think, of Dylan, who was personally one of my favorite characters? Oh yeah, um, you know, and he he was just unexpected. You you, you didn't you know, uh, you yeah, at first you just don't know 
what his relation is. He's like, okay, he's a brother. No, he's actually a half brother. <laughs> <laughs> through incest so yeah it's like yeah it but i mean that's where it really just got me into it just seeing all these other semi-known actors and then you know uh, uh this actor max theriot actually ends up directing a few episodes but it's just so cool just seeing kind of a on the waterfront kind of mentality just showing them just you know doing blue collar work at the docks where everyone's doing a side hustle that is clearly illegal you know <laughs> Uh, regardless of what the state's rules are or what anyone personally thinks of it, it's like, yeah, everyone's doing it. And it's like, <laughs> everyone's pretty much being threatened to work illegal overtime off the clock. May or may not even get the equivalent of that, but they're afraid of losing their fingers. Like, yeah, this, man, this is just shady, shady. <laughs> it makes sense. Cause, uh, and the whole time you're wondering, hmm, is he going to get killed along the way? You know, why is he not in any version of Psycho from this point forth? You know? <laughs> right. Um. So, uh, then, I mean, it's just so ironic how he co becomes closer to uh, Norma's older brother, who's technically, you know, the uncle of Norman, but is <laughs> what technically his dad. Yeah. <laughs> what a what a family. It's all in the family. All in the family, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably some taboo porn version of this. Thank God I haven't heard of it. <laughs> I, you know, they say, uh, what's the, the saying that any type of... Rule 34. Whatever, <laughs> <it's> <laughs> porn <God>. of everything. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, uh, so... What did you think of also just kind of like the supporting cast, like some of the other like vicious people, like one of the gangsters who decides to take over some of the doc business uh, played by Michael O'Neill, who you might know from shows like The Unit at 24? I started to watch both of those shows, but I thought his character was fantastic, honestly. I mean, I've not never seen him play a villain like this. He's guest starred plenty of times as like a mutated or a crooked deputy, but you know, as this is like, <laughs> right. like it's vicious, vicious, and that's before he even gets into the gunplay. <laughs> yeah. And oh man, um, oh, oh, what's her name? Uh, yeah, Jamie Ray Newman. Who you guys might know from a bunch of other shows. Uh, uh, she got to play uh, Rebecca Hamilton in season four. Um, Tracy Spiridakos, who you might know from Revolution and Chicago PD, plays the one of the prostitutes who Norman abuses. <laughs> and uh, season five, we had uh, God, we just had so many other people. Uh, we had Sheriff Jane, played by Brooke Smith from Silence of the Lambs. So it's like, yeah, this <laughs> is all kinds of unusual guest spots and. It's also interesting how you start off season one and it's a basically a crooked cop led town. You know, you got the deputy who's basically pressured Norma into basically just blackmailed her into sex. And then you got the sheriff who's pretty much just going around exacting his own vigilante justice. <laughs> if you're a scumbag, he's going to find a reason to just trick you into coming down, act as a buyer and then kill you and throw your body in the harbor. <laughs> Just an unusual setup. That it, just... it is. Yeah, it's very uh, almost a noir setup. Oh, totally noir. I mean, it, you, you can tell these cinematographers are definitely in love with it, with how they're lighting it. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah. And, and that's that's worth mentioning too. The the, uh, the photography on the show is pretty pretty good. Dolly. So I'm pretty much with you guys. I just it's unusual uh where where ability of where it goes and everything pretty much helps it stand out and that makes up for some of the over plotting and filler episodes <laughs> yeah. and there are there, there are a lot of filler episodes that's are, <laughs> yeah yeah I, especially in the uh like middle part you know like season two and season three i think season three is probably the stretch that gave me the toughest time <laughs> i was very annoyed too where i'm like can i just I, mean, I don't know if I want to continue with this. There, there. It, it was like it was episode to episode at one point. Where I was like, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, I'll stick it through. 
And uh, yeah. ultimately, I'm glad I did. So if anyone is listening and you start it and you feel like stopping it, but you're still kind of enjoying it, I would recommend st- sticking with it. <laughs> Definitely. And I get it. It's not easy. Everyone loves... Uh, uh, it just it, it it's gonna happen with every kind of writer and everything, good or bad. They're gonna just say, "Well, we love the sound of our own voice, and we just <laughs> need to have someone, you know, uh, police us a bit." Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, and you can tell they're all terror movie fans. I mean, the fact that the sheriff's name is Romero. I mean, that's <laughs> awesome enough. <laughs> I can't recall the actor who played him, but I thought his character was absolutely uh, Esther Carbonell, and he's oh, one of those. He's like a mixed. I think he's like a Brooklyn-born, like Italian or Latino mixed uh, actor. I'll have to fact check that, but huh. uh, yeah, I, I've known him since just playing the unusual mayor in the Dark Knight films. So it's like, yeah, okay, he's. Uh, I'm not surprised to see him on here because he he's just got that face. <laughs> right, he's an amazing actor. Yeah, he's apparently been in a lot of independent movies and guest starred on just about every show. But he was just one of those like it, he's basically who was at the second stage of his career on, at this point, and I guess maybe the third stage now. <laughs> <laughs> Did you expect him to go where he went? Where he's just like very demented at this point. He loses his badge and he's just like, okay, well. Anything I can do to avenge Norma's death. <laughs> did he end up going to prison? And like, did he, I can't remember. Did he escape? No, he didn't go to prison, but he talks to someone who he basically sent away, and he's basically blackmails him for some information, some dibs on other stuff. And okay, and his storyline does become a lot more... happens. <laughs> I know. Just <laughs> even the Wikipedia pages don't do it justice. You can tell they lost <laughs> yeah, they, track of. Uh, a lot happens in this series. You would have to be a super, super fan and be coherent enough to just sum it up. But yeah. Oh. And then seeing Norman actually just, you know, just when his brother Dylan comes up to him and says, let it go. It's just like that literally just makes him become just brain dead at that moment. All right. Letting everything go. <laughs> Death by happiness. Hmm. I didn't expect it to go there either. I thought it was just, okay, someone else is going to die. It's going to be too predictable. I was like, no? Okay, well, cool. Good on you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that was not predictable. <laughs> There's a lot in the series I didn't see coming. Some good, some bad. Okay, yeah, let, let, let's just dive into that. Because uh, I will say, there are a bunch of other people. Like, Michael Vartan like, shows up in season two. And I just found, I've never cared for that actor. But then... Again, to be fair, I just didn't think the character was all that well written. So I was just like, okay, so Norma's got this other boy toy who she wants to use, and he just like comes and goes. I'm like, so what was the point? So I think yeah, season three kind of got overplotted just because season two just started so many things that they weren't really ready to do anything with. And I, I get it. It's just once you're in love with something and you love the actors and you want to work with people, you'll do anything. And <laughs> After a while, you do got to just say, okay, now we are, again, we're overplotted. We, again, we got enough of a fascinating edge to draw someone in. We're getting both people who have never really heard of Psycho into this, and we got people who have, again, swear by the original Hitchcock movie. We're pro- I'm even surprised that we didn't even hear anyone sneak in something about, you know, from the infamous sequels, but I guess <laughs> those are silly enough. No one bothered. <laughs> yeah, we pretend those don't exist. I guess you so. You know what, though? I, I mean, I didn't think... Psycho 2 wasn't bad. I actually enjoyed Psycho 2. I haven't bothered with 3 or 4, but I enjoyed 2 for what it was. Yeah. 3 is watchable, <laughs> and I used to know a podcaster who like, like swore by it, and I didn't know why. I was like, really? And, yeah, it's funny. Ba- uh, there was, like, a TV pilot called Base Motel, which was infamous enough and, like, disowned. And then it's like... Anthony Perkins directed his own Psycho 4, and he's like, he swears by it. He's like, yeah, it's my favorite of the sequels. I'm like, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I haven't to even seen it. So, no. <laughs> to each their own. Yeah, I, I I recall part two being watchable, even though it got a Rift Tracks treatment. So it is what it is. I mean, it's just one of those every, I'm not 
I mean, I get into this argument with Hellraiser. It's like treat every entity as its own. Same thing with a season. It's like there's going to be a sequel, a season that can't one up the previous season. So I just got to treat it as its own entity, regardless of whether it has missed opportunities or not. And so it's like, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, at least everyone agrees with that. Psycho is just one of Hitchcock's, you know, just best movies just because it's so incredibly surreal. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder uh, how many people were introduced to Psycho through Bates Motel. Uh, I would be an interesting poll. It would be so interesting because, you know, there was a bunch of gals who got into it. They're like, oh, pretty high oh, cute. I mean, oh, he's playing a bad guy. Oh. <laughs> and then what did, what would they think of Psycho? Because, you know, if you're not. If you're not informed historically, you're, you're going to watch Psycho and probably not think a lot of it because so much of it has been imitated in how many years now 60 years since then yeah it's 60 years since psycho 60 years yeah 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 so in the 60 years since then so much has been imitated and surpassed because you know 1960 or 61 whenever psycho came out you still had the production code so you know i i wonder whatever generation z or people unfamiliar with hitchcock unfamiliar with psycho Watching Bates Motel and then going to Psycho, unless you do your research, I wonder what you would think of Psycho itself. Pretty much. I mean, it helps that, you know, we were already, this was the 2010s, and we're already getting sick of remakes slash reboots. And I think it just helped that everyone was just taken aback by all the names attached, you know, both in front of and behind the scenes. And then just flat out just say, and by the way, this has no real connection. We're, we're going on our own version of the storyline. <laughs> and so I think yeah, when, you yeah. just, when you just toss out those comparisons to answer your question, I think everyone's just open. They're along for the ride. And uh, it's interesting also just seeing, uh, I looked at one of the co-creator Ethrin's uh, comments. He, I think he sums it up here. Uh, uh, just on uh, on the characters. Uh, what did he just say here? I just scrolled up past it. Um, and basically, uh, uh, we try to approach all the character in the show characters in the show as morally complex. I think it's more that they were lost than they're bad. Emma's mother, for instance, was a lost person. Bradley was a lost person by the time she died. It's more about how people get lost by bad decisions, by secrets, by not living in the light, by not living in the truth. Mm. Hmm. I think you're too in love with your characters. I think there's a lot of these <laughs> guys who had to die. Oh, or at least be in the institution. But <laughs> Yes, yeah. which is different from uh, moral culpability. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. So I squeeze this all. Emma survives. I'm correct. Yes. Okay. <laughs> She's like the only precious person who spared. Yeah, survives. And, and I just thought sure. somewhere along the way, they're going to do the God forbidden. You know, someone's going to get drowned in a bathtub or some bullshit. You know? <laughs> uh, and yeah, I kind of knew that you, all, you know, going in that, um, you know, Norman is, you know, without redemption. But yeah, by the time he kills uh, Nicola Peltz's character, uh, Bradley Martin, this is like, yeah. In either season two or three, I was like, yeah, of course he's going to kill her. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And just death by rock. She brings out the worst in him because she's attractive, but she's got even more baggage than him. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. What's that one horror movie, I think? Or it's actually a comedy. Bitches leave. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, it made, I liked how, even though it's got sleazy content in it, it didn't really feel like a softcore, you know, Skinamax kind of thing. It's like, yeah, no, they're, all these losers are hanging out at the strip club because that's just where, you know, uh, uh, blue collar workers tend to hang out at, you know, <laughs> get some action. <laughs> and it's kind of even more interesting how they just 
uh, I wasn't surprised that there was the death of an animal because it's just that's generally what's been kind of proven for serial killers. But <laughs> but you could I, I let it go because I know you know the filmmakers clearly aren't serial killers. You know it didn't feel like a bad exploitation movie where someone may or may <laughs> not be enough a joke. And it's like yeah you, you just know that uh, that ugly dog is gonna get killed just because uh, basically. Happens. Uh, just the minute Norma, well, it happens, and yeah, you, just the minute you you see Norma just say, "Hey, you got to get rid of it," is like, "Oh, okay." So this is becoming between him, you know, pissed off my mom who I'm close to unnecessarily, or <laughs> am I close to the animal? Nope, I got to make the animal die by playing a mind game with him. Death by accidental car accident. Got it. <laughs> oh, so any other actors or unusual characters that you guys took away from this? I don't, I can't really think of any, but again, I watched it during its run. So it's not that fresh in my mind. Oh, good. I saw the character Richard played by guess what? Canadian actor, Richard Harmon, who you guys might know from shows. Yeah. He's on The Killing and he was on Continuum as the terrorist kid. So, yeah, it's like when when it, the minute I saw him on this, I'm like, yeah, of course, he's going to be a douchebag. <laughs> just, uh, one just character. Got the face. Oh, go ahead, man. Sorry. Uh, that's it. Uh, all I would say is, of course, he's got the face to just play these just, you know, brutal characters. But, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, what did y'all think about Caleb, the kind of rapist brother? Oh, but yeah, good point. Kind of made into a good guy, weirdly enough. Yeah, he pretty much just, he, he, after pretty much berating it in the most predictable way, saying, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I can change, I'm not proud of what I did, is like, he pretty much, from that point on, the minute he gets rejected again, is like, he pretty much says, okay, so at least me and the son I birthed are going to get along, and we're going to try and, you know, build a barn with, Marijuana. <laughs> and, yeah, and, uh, and just a very perverse relationship. Definitely. Yeah, all around. Like, I'm already a huge ass fan of Kenneth Johnson from uh, The Shield. So to me, this was like if Lim from The Shield had survived and then just gotten fucked up in some other kind of unusual way. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, yeah, of course. He'd be dealing drugs. He'd be in a perverted awful you know relationship <laughs> maybe not really but i just the minute he started you know it con- could be the same universe yeah. oh well uh, in, in all fairness that there is actually going to be a shield connection with these other shows believe it or not so we'll get into that but yeah i mean uh, just the minute he started getting into gunplay i was just like limb is back <laughs> <laughs> oh man and did a great job with his character. Uh, I think everyone really did, even though I'm not a fan of Vera Farmiga. I can understand why everyone just got into really? where they got. Yeah, she's just her voice is just such a turn off for me. I'm just like, it just feels like she's playing to the camera as opposed to getting into the character. But I love her. I love her. It's sure. fine. I, I just, there's so many other. Uh, horror movie or crime mystery guy gals who I think would have just gotten into that role more. But at the same time, I, I get it. They, they wanted to go for people who were in the TV and just more independent film industry. Just give them a shot. Fair, fair enough. One thing that this is off topic of the podcast, but have you ever seen this movie called up in the air? Yeah. I did see yeah. Was, that, was that with Clooney? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was a good movie. Yep. I, was was. Was really good check movie, out. Yeah. I think she does a good job in that one. Oh, good. I thought I thought that was actually a great movie. <laughs> Dude, absolutely. Like that's probably in my top fifteen of all time, if I'm being honest. Oh, oh wow, yeah. wow. I need Jason to watch. Rickman, it. Yeah. I haven't watched it in a while, but yeah, I really, really liked it. And definitely one of the many that uh, is like a, an exception to the rule, like where both audiences and critics could agree on the same thing. <laughs> right. But yeah, um, so I mean, I guess to close this out, I mean, I think Bates Motel just does the serial killer drama just slightly better than, you know, other shows that got messy over time, like Dexter or <laughs> just any other crime drama where they run out of 
pretty much people to fill a body bag with. It was like <laughs> after a while, it just became, hey, yeah, it's not going to be who dies this season. It's going to be more who gets ruthless to the point of just losing their mind. And by next season, they're not the same character. So I think they got at least that down, even though, like you guys said, there were some just serious issues with being a little too full of itself at times. <laughs> yes. Happens. <laughs> so, um, historically, um, a &E was kind of trying to become the horror channel for a bit. It happens when you're playing reruns of Criminal Minds and got Pawn Stars and other reality shows on. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like they had Damien, uh, the ex, uh, the Omen uh, sequel on, and I have to say, this is probably my favorite out of all three. I just really, it, even though it it's a one season deal, shouldn't have been. Uh, just perfectly cast just having barbara hershey be just a religious nutcase and just uh the unknown actor i've never heard of him really before but he's like been in a bunch of mystery and horror movies and even one of the underworld films and uh bradley james just i totally bought him as damian thorne he just just unsuspecting just you know uh you know demon possessed guy and just the rest of the cast was really good but yeah, as a connection, Glenn Mazzara, who had worked on The Walking Dead and The Shield, worked on both this and The Exorcist show. And uh, I just uh, I, I just really dug the cast. And But before we were getting started, we were like, warning, we're, we're going to piss off a few Exorcist and Omen fans. But, <laughs> uh, I mean, those kind of both go on the same, in my opinion, just both. Just those both kind of introduce the world to just folklore on, you know, demon possession and... Uh, mentally unstable people who may or may not be telling the truth, you know, is like we had silly stuff like, uh, Oh, what's the one about the haunted house that inspired other stuff like conjuring and other stuff. Um, paranormal Amity, not paranormal. Uh, Amityville horror is oh, yeah. like for a while, everything had to be claimed. Oh, based on a true story. And, you know, it's like, actually was just based on a book. And I guess the omen was also based on a book. I think so. You know, it could have. It was at the time considered a decent movie as well as a knockoff of Exorcist, and it's just like it's just stupid. It's like they both came out around the same time. It's like, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I just got to say, Damien deserved at least one or two more seasons. It it was such a fast at ten episodes. It went so by so much fast, and even though there is a little dead space, it it really keeps you. It's for the most part pretty well paced. It just, uh, and it's got a lot of the stuff you guys might like, and just other kinds of just supernatural kind of just you know, uh, cops going around investigating unusual stuff without necessarily being a procedural, but you know just uh, the the plot twists were just a lot of fun, and uh, just the whole cast is pretty dynamite. Um, but yeah, The Exorcist show, it's got probably the slowest moments, and that just goes back to that's just what The Exorcist was to begin with. And I, I think that one works, but, and I actually knew someone, uh, Eve Butterly, nice gal, who was a script supervisor for one episode when it filmed in Chicago. And uh, that one was interesting because basically uh, it uh, uh, you know, you have the priest who's going around who's uh, almost getting possessed himself and, you know, his other assistants, some who will go to even more brutal, inhumane means just to, you know, the waterboard someone just to get the demon out of you. And I can't say I'm a religious, you know, person or even frightful of that stuff, but I understand why it uh, it, it does affect certain people. I, I, I had a friend who's Mother would allow him to watch anything, rent anything, did not care. Here's five bucks, rent it. You know, it is what it is, whatever content. I know you're not going to grow up to be a psycho, you know, and uh, but as long as it's not the exorcist, you know, you, you can you can bring it home. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting what movies have really just traumatized certain people all these years. But 
Uh, yeah, this one also had a dynamite cast that had David. Uh, God, who was the other cast? Um, yeah, it was a mixer of British people and American people once again. And uh, it, I thought it was a wise idea to have them instead of just do a who don't done it. They, they actually kind of would start suspecting how many people in the church are corrupted by this demon already, you know? <laughs> and, like, season one was pretty much just investigating the Vatican as well as the standalone family and how the family is just so connected to the girl to where it's like they, they just are like, this may be the best way to get rid of the demon, but, you know, we're, we're just falling under her spell because, you know, they got into us and they got our emotional you know, connection. They're taking advantage of that. So even if it is a demon, I just can't let you do anything. Can't let you do your job, which is to exercise the demon. <laughs> uh, season two pretty much has had a totally standalone family. This is like, and, and I think it was better for that because by that point, now it's the priest is also the secondary plot where he's becoming possessed. And the, again, much like base motel, there will be, again, there's going to be some episodes where you're like, pretty sure this could just you know three episodes could just become one but it was really cool to see gina davis play against type in season one kind of a mild comeback role for her because she's kind of been quiet lately <laughs> yeah i don't remember the last time i saw her in anything new. <laughs> or that was good <laughs> true <laughs> um I, i'm intrigued by damien now that's for sure yeah, I it, so yeah. Uh, once again, everyone can watch uh, Bates Motel on Peacock, and uh, uh, both Damien and The Exorcist show can be seen on Hulu. And if you're like me, you'll pay three dollars extra just to have it be commercial free. <laughs> Absolutely, I cannot stand the ads. Yeah, Hulu was like the worst because. They'd already had gotten better somewhat at having more content, more options. And then it got to where it's like, but now you're still playing the same exact ads. So this cannot, this will not stand. <laughs> Out you go ads. So I think we're all pretty much in agreement. Just whatever you guys have seen, it's, it's recommended. Uh, obviously there's some flaws in every one of them, but pretty much the good outweighs the bad and uh, i'd say they all pretty much end on a solid note although unfortunately the other two you know you know exorcist definitely leaves it open on a cliffhanger but uh damien you know is like okay well if that ends there that's at least a fun evil ending <laughs> <laughs> without giving anything away but yeah it's <laughs> like uh i mean i think you guys all hit the nail on the head in terms of how you know, Bates started off the show of let's just, you know, revisit a popular terror movie. And, you know, he's all had a lot of the same producers and uh, cast and essentially just the style was all there. It's like if only they would approach that with even just these movies that are coming out. Like, I can't say I'm crazy about just every other slasher from the 80s or 90s has to be revisited now like scream is coming out i'm not sure if that'll be any good you know it's just, i'm pretty I sure hope so. i'm a huge I'm, scream fan i hope it's good <laughs> I, i'm pretty sure it won't be good i i like the first scream and maybe even the second but i mean the last the last few screams were i actually just rewatched scream too i'm actually rewatching them all to prepare for five and I, honestly, like the more and more I watch Scream Two, the more I love it. That's one you should definitely revisit. I do like the, I do like the first sequel. I I rem the fourth is the fourth is where it really seemed to go off a cliff. See, I think four is better than three. Okay. I think a lot of stuff is better than part three, but yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, that, fair. I'm giving that an example much. on how it seems like either way, regardless of whether you like it or hate it, it seems like everything has to just be. Just a sequel first, for sequel's first sake. Scream, though, is pretty brilliant. Yeah, their scream is really good. Yeah, oh, and it pretty much kept the genre alive when it was just now becoming rele relegated to just, you know, cheesy TV or director video movies. And it's like, yeah, slashers can still be alive. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
I, I was working in a movie theater when that one came out. So that was oh, sweet. Nice. I also did some time in a movie theater. Uh, best, I wish I had that opportunity. Best I tried. time of my life was when I was working in a movie theater and then at a video store afterwards. The uh, oh, the movie theater per- the movie theater perks were just uh, free movies. Right. We essentially, four four passes every day except weekends. It was like two free passes and two passes I had to pay a dollar each, so I can go myself and with three other people. <laughs> Every day, I mean. Every day, baby. <laughs> yeah, and, and they gave free popcorn too. Yeah, it was really like the, the perks <laughs> made it the best job ever. Yeah, that's what we need, cause as opposed to everyone, you know, bitch slaps each other at whether or not they like the latest Star Wars or Halloween movies. Like that's just too much. When it just becomes that toxic of fandom, I don't really want any part of it. I want it to be just a civil. I liked it, didn't like it, you know. <laughs> yeah, and Unfortunately, nothing could be like. No, everything everything is just uh, everything must polar- be villainized or yes, like I say, politicized. Or everything polarized. politicized. Everything is politicized. How it's- dare I, I'm for women's rights, but how dare there be a strong woman in there? Or and, and then it just comes back to, uh, was the plot good? No, I didn't buy the plot, but then sometimes no one can even say that, or or they just do a chicken shit answer, like, I didn't like it. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> now you're just asking to be bitch slapped by the other guy who might also be a dick who also liked the movie, or has a legit reason. It's just like, every, we're talking about characters in the gray, I mean, <laughs> it definitely gets into the gray. You can't tell who's like a neo-Nazi trolling internet movie database versus just legit is giving a sincere opinion and doing their best to actually have a proper synod structure. <laughs> it's impossible to tell the difference now. Oh, totally. And when all the new streaming networks were coming out, like during COVID, everyone was just like instant reaction. I'm like, what do you expect? It's not going to pick up right away. <laughs> I mean, you're also complaining about, oh, there's nothing I want to watch. Then don't watch it. <laughs> Shit. And just leave it at that. If I do or don't like something, I'm going to still at least do my best to just try and still give a proper, you know, polite answer of could not get into this show. And I had it on all day. Ten episodes later, don't care. You know, something like that instead of just uh, I'm seeing other people who want to just constantly say this is the best of all time. And I'm like, oh, OK, now you're asking for you know an argument. <laughs> if you're going there. Unless it or really the worst of all time. <laughs> it's just like, well, what is the best of all time? <laughs> Especially when it's just come out. I mean, there's plenty of stuff that we loved when it first came out and then couldn't stand years later. So things have to stand doesn't mean really to become the best of all time. But. It really has to be. Or or at least to a point where you can't stop thinking about it. You've talked about it numerous times and as an immediate reaction, yeah, I'm with you. It would be pretty hard to say. Because if it is the best of all time, you probably have to watch it a few times to figure that out, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have not seen Breaking Bad multiple times, but I know it's a good show, aside from just the critical acclaim, because I think about it. Every it is day. the best of all time. There you go. <laughs> right. I, I, I've watched Breaking Bad probably six times. So the- there you go. But, I mean, I even then, I just... Time. I get more I, out of each time, which is insane. Uh, right yeah. we're out of time just catching up with all the other stuff because it's like everyone's giving up cable for the most part i still have it but there might be a time where i say you know what i don't want to pay 30 bucks a month anymore fuck it uh, yeah eventually i think cable is gonna disappear i mean it's just, I, the, the um, number of streaming services is out of control like i have no idea where to see movies i want to see at this point <laughs> oh totally and if you don't want that then there's a third party source you know that'll never go away just have a yeah. vpn and you might even watch an old show that someone was fortunate enough to record and has uploaded the whole thing on youtube or daily motion so i mean there's going to be a way to watch what you want to watch and i mean there's even those third party sites where it's just so wild how the various uh there's many pe- people who are like oh i own this franchise and oh i I refuse to uh, release it even though there's clearly an audience for it but oh you're making money off it yeah remove remove (laughs) it's like seriously yeah okay (laughs) 
if I can't make money off something I'm too stupid to release, then how dare you, sir? No one can. <laughs> no one is going to watch it. No one can watch it. Watch it for free. How dare you care about it and remind me that people actually like it? <laughs> and it seems like there's a bit of that sabotaging. There's. I don't know why they even release anything in the spring if they just know people are going to bitch and just say, oh, it's clearly bad. <laughs> it's become such a trend where it's like, that's bad. It's like, there's no wonder no one wants to see your movie if they think you don't have any, you know, uh, belief in it, you know, don't have any pride in it. <laughs> and I mean, I was even talking about this on the Deadwood episode, how uh, there's a lot of mo movie channels that, reared their ugly head and were like yeah we we air this stuff but we don't actually like it and the guy who uh is now the head of stars used to be the head of hbo and he's like yeah we don't actually like true blood or sex in the city or sopranos and it's like then why air it <laughs> you guys <laughs> we don't like the sopranos that <laughs> instant that, just, yeah yeah you know that that that's not just a disagreement. That's someone who's wrong. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it's my opinion. Well, your opinion's wrong. I'm sorry. Like some opinions <laughs> are wrong. A lot of things are opinion and aren't wrong, but some things can be wrong. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So and so was not an inspirational filmmaker. Uh, when and where? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. Thank you all for being on here. This was a fun, to the point conversation. Enjoyable as always. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank you for having us. Always. <laughs> I hope you guys have a great holiday. Happy yes. New Year. We're going to exercise Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Get it one and done. <laughs> exercise Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> exercise the Jesus. <laughs> Big about. <laughs> Yeah. Before I start quoting Big Lebowski, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how I spend most of my uh, social media posting is just quoting Big Lebowski. Because it's just an appropriate quote for almost any circumstance. <laughs> <laughs> it's another podcast, though. There you go. We'll return after these messages. Hey, feeling down? Feeling low? Not enough podcasts about movies in your life? Why not try... They must be destroyed on sight! The new Podcast Cure-All. Sure to get you right with the world and on a path to better living. We have exploitation. We have Italian horror. We have zombies. We have slashers. We have crime films. We have spaghetti westerns. We even have sci-fi and sex comedies. So take a dose of... They must be destroyed on sight! As needed, and let the hosts, Lee Russell, Daniel Harper, Paul Romali, and the odd guest host, cure what ails you. Warning, may cause atrophy, African consumption, black fever, bone shave, chin puff, colic, cramp colic, dropsy of the brain, elephantitis, grocer's itch, jaundice, mania, miasma, mortification, palsy, pox disease, rheumatism, scurvy, St. Anthony's fire, summer complaint, and worm fit in some people. Consult a physician before listening. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Ah, uh, necrophilia. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't, don't push it. Cinema PsyOps is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this <laughs> No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, prudes. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most sincerest of senses, disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. Oh, I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I, I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get it's out of. It's unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this one. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this, like, 
little nerd glee with everything that kept little history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped from watching this shit at twelve years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was. How did be you watch movie. this shit at twelve? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. Hey everybody, I'm Corey. And I'm Zach. And we're the hosts of Podcasting After Dark, a cast dedicated to late night horror and sci-fi of the 80s and 90s, often found on HBO and Cinemax. You know, the movies your parents didn't want you watching as a kid. You can find us every other week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. This is what you want. This is what you get. It's time, let's check our cue, baby. Pair it with a couple brews, baby. We love good movies. We love the bad ones, too. So we watch them all and pass their lessons on to you. Oh, yeah. Everything I learned from movies Helps to make life a little bit groovy With a one last plot holes a gratuitous movies It's time to get busy with your friend Stephen Izzy At eilfm.podbean.com We now continue with our program Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up review show. 